Um, well, we're running slightly behind, but I, uh, I want to make sure we have ample time for our next guest. Uh, and that's Alan Murray of Fortune, uh, Fortune Magazine or Fortune Media. Um, most of you know Fortune. Uh, their manifesto is to drive the conversation about business. It's the number one source for influential and affluent executives compared to similar publications and over 20 million digital and print subscribers uh, are subscribed to Fortune. Uh, Alan is a, is a fascinating guy. I've been reading his uh, emails on a daily basis, as I referenced earlier. Uh, he's the president and CEO of Fortune Media, and he oversees the business and editorial operations of the independent media company. Um, he previously was the president of the Pew Research Center, and he was also the deputy managing editor in other roles at the Wall Street Journal, um, and he was the Washington bureau chief for CNBC. Uh, he's also the author of several books, including an upcoming book called Tomorrow's Capitalist, My Search for the Soul of Business. And that'll be out on May 10th. Uh, so I hope all of you will buy Alan's book when, it's, uh, when it comes out. Maybe you can even pre-order it right now. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So please uh, join me in welcoming Alan Murray to the stage. Sure, off that screen. We got your picture. We, we, we got the book up there. It's yeah, it's fantastic. When can you pre order the book now? You can pre order the book now. And pre ordering the book is a good thing for me. It sort of generates some <laughs> excitement and gets you in a better place in the search rankings and all of that. So please do. You can even pre order it and then cancel it the last day. You know? <laughs> Alan, we've uh, so we've been talking about a lot of different issues here, and I want to, there's so many things that I could talk to you about. Um, but one, one issue that we haven't touched on too, too much is, is the war in Ukraine. And uh, we're, you know, we're obviously in the middle of this, no, none of us know how it's gonna come out, but it, it's certainly affecting a lot of companies. And I've been talking to many organizations about that have employees in both Russia and Ukraine or one or the other. Uh, we had one company that we were talking to recently who has Russians reporting to Ukrainians in the company, yeah. um, which is awkward to say the least. Um, and I'm just curious how, you know, you're talking to CEOs on a regular basis. You know, what are you, what are you hearing from those CEOs about, about the war? Yeah, it's been such an interesting two weeks. And, and Kevin, it's, this is not a, a digression from the topic. This is right in the, everything you've been talking about this morning and the role of talent and human capital in organizations. I think this is a key demonstration of, of what, that has done to the way organizations run. I mean, if you look at what's happened in the last, what's it been, 16 days, uh, the decision by McDonald's mm -hmm. to shut down eight, about 850 of its own stores, give up $10 billion in revenue. And by the way, for the first few days, it looked like they weren't going to do that. And then there was a Twitter hashtag campaign that pushed right. them over the hump. You look at the decision of those three oil companies to say, uh-uh, we're not going to do it anymore. Uh, there was a reference to Accenture in the earlier presentation. Accenture said, not just we're going to suspend contracts with the government, we're going to stop doing all business in Russia. I, I've been doing this for four decades. There has never been anything remotely like this in the history of business interaction with society. Right. Normally the business approach, if you think about Iran as an example, would be to wait for the sanctions and then right. obey the law. But in this case, companies are feeling, feeling compelled, and this is what we should talk about, compelled to step up and get ahead of the sanctions and say, no, this is about our values. This is about morality. We're not gonna do it anymore. And that's a huge change. That wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, it really has been remarkable, some of the reactions um, by companies. Uh, I know I've, I've talked to people at Accenture and that was not an easy decision. Um, you know, they've offered to some of their Russian employees, you can transfer internally, but nobody wants Russian employees right now. You know, they can go, UAE, uh, you know, is, is one area where, where folks can go to. Um, but for the expats that are there too, that it's been even doubly hard. It's, cause, cause yeah, it's very complicated. And the other thing they tell me is that they're the part of the thing that they're trying to work into the calculation is the potential for backlash against those employees. Right. Right. Uh, I was talking to two uh, CEOs of hotel chains, both of which have hotels still operating in Russia. Yeah. And that's exactly what they're dealing with. In, in fact, uh, a number of them, 
It's an off-the-record conference, isn't it? It's we have a cone of silence over this. Com oh yeah, yeah, you did the Maxwell Smart thing. That yeah, was yeah. old people like me really appreciated that. <laughs> uh, um, uh, one of the things they said was that they employ a lot of Ukrainians mm. in their hotels in Russia. So there's a huge concern for the safety of their associates. They're also housing a lot of people who are trying to, you know, for various reasons, get out of their existing living arrangements. Uh, they have a lot of diplomats staying at the hotels. They have reporters staying at the hotels. So it's a very complex thing. I mean, it's, you know, there was this big social media push, say, break all ties. But uh, inside these companies, it's, it's just not that easy. But the, but the compulsion to take action and make a strong principled stand against Russia is unlike anything we've ever seen. The one sort of comparable example was what uh, uh, business did in the 70s and 80s uh, to bring down the apartheid regime in mm -hmm. South Africa. But that was a process that took 15 years. This happened in 15 days. Uh, so it's, it, 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 it's a, a, a real sign of a change in the way businesses function in society. And I think it's, going to test our agility can continue to test our agility going forward. I think we've only started to see some of the ramifications, right, to different organizations, um, you know, based on supply chain or other issues. You know, and there's just, it's just so complex uh, what companies are going to have to deal with. I, you know, I talked a lot about agility in the beginning, and I, I called out some CEOs. And I know you know all these guys, so don't tell them I called them out, please. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm, I'm curious how you think about that as you look at, you know, the agility of some of these organizations. And you've written about, you know, some of their, some of their policies. You know, what do you think the future You're talking about hybrid, hybrid work now. Yeah, that's part of it. Yep. Well, let me talk about the hybrid work piece, and then we can talk about other pieces. But... Um, uh, yeah, you use David Solomon of Goldman Sachs, and he's sort of become the poster boy for the get back to the office crowd. Right. I'm stunned by your statistic about what was it, 52% say they want people back full time. That's not what I'm hearing from most of the CEOs I'm talking about. David Solomon is very much an outlier. In fact, if you go, you know, 100 yards down the street from Goldman Sachs office, you have American Express. Right. American Express has taken a completely different approach. I, prior to the pandemic, uh, uh, the CEO, Steve Squarey, told me prior to the pandemic, they had about 20 percent of their staff working remote full time. They now expect that to go to 40 percent. So full 40 percent of their staff will be allowed to work remotely full time. And for the rest of the workers, what they're calling hybrid, they're only requiring an average of two days a week. Mm -hmm. So less than half time. Uh, and, and, and this is a New York financial firm. I mean, you know, on the, on the, West, on the West Coast, on the left coast, it's very different. It's even looser. So most of the companies that I talk to, uh, most of the companies that I talk to are, are taking a pretty loose hybrid approach. And, and I kind of, I know uh, you and Jared, you know, we're into this, like there's a big battle between employees and employers and employers of the Neanderthals who, you know, are <laughs> control freaks. And I don't think we use those terms specifically. Yeah, you yeah. came close. Somebody said control freak. <laughs> I want to stand up for my age group here. I am a CEO, actually, so I got to. But I don't I think that oversimplifies what's going on. Look, I've spent a lot of my time over the last two years both talking to people about this and looking at the research. There has been good research done about this over the course of the last two years. And I think a couple of things are obvious. One is pr productivity is not suffered. Let's just get that off the table. I don't know who those 47, 48% are in the Microsoft survey, but no C again, no CEO I talk to thinks productivity is suffered. Yeah. Many of them think it's increased. When you, when you take commuting off the table and you give people flexibility in their lives, they work hard, they've proven it. So, so that's not the issue, but there is an issue. Uh, uh, surveys show that people's sense of belonging to the organization they work for has on average gone down. I see that in our own organization. Uh, Jared hit on some of that. Uh, I thought the weak ties, strong ties distinction was an important one because teams have done a pretty good job staying in touch, but, but, uh, but the interaction between teams 
which relies more on weak ties. That's where, you know, maybe having lunch together or being in the office together or that that has clearly frayed. And it's one of the things driving the great resignation. It's just there's no there's not as much emotional attachment to the company as there was when everybody was working in the same space. And so it's just much easier if somebody comes along and dangles a few more dollars yeah. and don't let anyone tell you that it's not about money. I mean, there, there was a good Pew report out uh, a couple of weeks ago that showed money was the number one reason. But the point is the friction has gone. If somebody comes along and offers you more money or a better career path or something that seems more aligned with your values, you jump because you don't feel the same friction, the same connection to your employer. And that's what that's what the managers are feeling. They see that happening. They know it's happening. I mean, the number of people, you know, uh, you've seen these statistics and I can't remember it exactly. People who take jobs and then leave them before they ever went to the office. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the, the friction is gone. And from the manager's standpoint, it just makes it much harder to keep the organization together. So the office may not be culture, but we're going to have to do something to, uh, uh, to replace the pieces of culture that the office provided, because there was a glue there that is now going away. Let me make a couple of other points. We are I love the avatars. I'll do the avatars. I'm all in. Holograms would be even better. But we are social animals. I mean, I, I got here at 10 o'clock last night, very tired, walking to my room and had to go through the bar area. There was stuff going on in that bar area that avatars cannot do. I, I promise you, it will never be replaced for, by avatars. The fact that all of you are here in this room uh, has something to do with the value of physical contact. That is not going to go away. So I think, you know, coming up with strategies to take advantage of that, and I don't think anybody's really figured this out. A lot of the companies that I talk to that are doing hybrid, they're leaving it to the teams. Yeah. Say, so your team can come in whenever you think it's appropriate and work remotely whenever you think it's appropriate. But that doesn't solve the weak ties problem. Because if your team comes in on Monday and Tuesday and my team comes in on Thursday and Friday, they're never going to see each other. Uh, so I, I, I still think we have a long way to go to work this out. There's some legitimate issues that have to be sorted out. Yeah, we are in the beginning stages of this. I, um, I heard some other uh, stats from Microsoft yesterday that is more around the team makeup itself. So teams that have been together for a long time and are highly tenured, they don't necessarily need to be in the office, Great point. right? Uh, but teams that are new or have those weaker ties, those are the ones that probably can benefit. Great, from great point. And there are a couple of other sort of interesting offshoots. For instance, the culture, the office culture piece, office culture, you know, it did decline and the sense of belonging of most workers went down. Mm -hmm. But actually, the surveys I've seen show that for underrepresented groups, the sense of belonging went up. So it's like that culture may have been strong, but it didn't work for everybody. It was excluding uh, uh, people. Um, and, and so we have to, it gives us an opportunity to rethink all of this and say, can we do this in a better, more inclusive way? Um, so we, um, you saw some of the attrition stats and you talked to a lot of CEOs. Obviously attrition is, uh, you know, through the roof, highest uh, attrition rates we've seen in decades. Um, as you're thinking about all these issues and talking to CEOs about these issues, how worried are they about this, you know, war for talent, this great resignation? Oh, it is the number one issue on the minds of CEOs. Abs I mean, you, you know, for the last 15 days, Russia has been the number one issue on the right. mind of CEOs. But sure. for the last six months, the, in polls, in conversations, this is always cited as the top issue. They're, they're very much worried about it. And, and, and that's, and, you know, I think many of them know that there's some sort of equation to the fact that everybody's out of the office and the fact that the talent train is so great. And that's why some of them feel this compulsion to bring everybody back. Yep. I think the, the great opportunity, and you laid this out very nicely, the great opportunity here is to say, okay, we know what the problem is. We need to address it. But forcing everybody into a, a, a downtown office that's hard to get to is not the only way to address it. Let's yeah. figure out better ways. Yep. Yeah, I guess, I guess I'm thinking about those better ways. And clearly, you know, we've got an audience here of HR professionals what I've witnessed over the last couple of years in, in particular, and, but it started before the pandemic, is HR and CEOs became much tighter, right? We saw a, a number of organizations 
And I love going into companies where the head of HR is sort of the right-hand person to that yeah. CEO, or you know, in that inner you know, three, four person circle that's running the company, which makes sense to me because they're, they're in charge of the people I, side. I think this was going on long before the pandemic. There's some really interesting research that was done uh, uh, a few months ago that looked at the balance sheets of Fortune 500 companies back in the 1970s and, and compared it to the balance sheets of Fortune 500 companies today. Right. And what they found was in the 1970s, more than 80% of the value on the balance sheet of, of Fortune 500 companies was physical stuff. It was oil in the ground. It was plants and equipment that you had got. You had a lot of capital, and so you could build a lot of plant. It was inventory on the shelves. It was things that you needed sure. capital to accumulate. Uh, and the more you had, the more value you could create. You do the same exercise now, and you find more than 85 percent of the value on the balance sheets of Fortune 500 companies is intangibles. It's intellectual property, it's brand value. It's all things that are tied to your people, to your human capital, to the, the folks that can walk out the door on any given day. And so, and so what you all do has become a much more important source of value for companies today than it was 50 years ago. And that's been building steadily over that period. Then the pandemic, you know, just increased it. Right, escalated it. Escalated it, and and the and there was public policy too. Look, we did unprecedented stimulus of the economy at a time when a pandemic was leading unprecedented numbers of workers to say, "I'm done. Yeah. I'm not going to work anymore." So you ended up with like way too much demand, way too few people to do it. It's across the board in every job category. I mean, it's always been, it's been true for coders for a long time, but we're talking about everything from the people who make the beds at the Marriott to, you know, all the way up, up the ladder. And so that's only added to what was a continuing trend uh, of, of I, I love the way you put it, which was uh, uh, the, in the battle for talent, talent won. Yeah. That's well, where we are. I stole that line. I didn't create it. So, but, um, <laughs> But you know, as we as we think about this, Alan, you talk to a lot of um, boards as well as uh, CEOs, um, and you you read my book. You read Culture Renovation, so thank you for Love doing it. that. Thank you. Um, I I'll buy yours if you'll buy mine. I will. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go back to my table and pre-order right now. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking about how we view culture from from the board perspective. And I'm sure you've seen this more and more boards today are concerned about the culture of the organizations that yeah. they govern, right? And yeah. they're putting in uh, more measures around that, asking for more data around it. I've even, there are some companies in the audience here who have set up a separate culture subcommittee yeah. off of their board, right? To, to talk about culture. So as you talk to you know, some of those CEOs and as you read the book, what were your thoughts around what more we could do around culture? I think there are, num there are a number of things, and I apologize if this isn't directly responsive, but, but it's where my mind goes when you ask that question. First of all, this is what's going on in the, in the economy, the things we're talking about, has dramatically changed the job of the leader. Uh, you know, if you, again, if you go back, it's helpful to put these things in like a 50 year perspective. So you go back to the 20th century, companies were basically information hierarchies. You had all these people out in the field doing their job, they would get information, all that information would be passed up to the top. And then a bunch of people would sit in the C suite and come up with a strategy. And then the orders would come back down, right? You know, here's what you do. And so the job of the people at the top was to tell you what to do. That's gone. I mean, first of all, if you, first of all, information doesn't travel that way anymore. We know information is omnidirectional. It, you know, it explodes on social media in seconds. Uh, but second, the pace of change is so fast. If you waited for that hierarchical process to take place, you would be dead. You would lose. I mean, you yeah. get at this in the book. You can't wait for somebody to formulate a strategy way up there who's getting the information later than you are. And, and what that means is that the people up there their jobs have just changed completely. It's yeah. much less about telling people what to do and much more about creating the circumstances where they will do it well. Mm -hmm. You know, you give them, uh, 
again, I've been doing this for four decades. It's really only in the last five years that I heard anybody talk about morality in the context of business leadership. Right. I mean, you had ethics, you had obey the laws, all that kind of stuff, but the importance of setting a moral path because that's the only way you can keep your workers on track. And you, you talked a lot about management by objectives. That's an important part of it as well. But it's just changed so much that leaders have to be, uh, Here's another great example. I'm sorry, but my, my mind doesn't work. I love where your mind's going. So it, that's, it's, that's not it's not linear. It's not linear. But a, another great example is going on in Florida right now. Uh, Bob Ch Chappick, the CEO of Disney, you know, is caught in this political situation yeah. where a law has been passed that's viewed as discriminatory by LGBTQ people. Um, and he, but, you know, Disney World is, is huge and dependent on the government and dependent on government support in multiple ways. And so he was trying to play it safe. Yeah, you can't play it safe in this environment. So there's all these new pressures that leaders have to deal with. None of them learned anything about that in business school. There is nothing in business school that teaches you that. No, I, I totally agree. And there's so much um, there's so much pressure to take a stance immediately, right? So the Disney one is a great example, but employees are expecting that today. They want to work for no an organization that they believe in, right? That has a purpose that they can rally around. And when uh, situations happen in society that maybe they disagree with, they want to understand how does our company look at that? You know, what is our stance on this? It, it's such a big change. And, and, and just to my point, leaders are not prepared to do that. At, at one of the things we've done at Fortune, I, I appreciated your introduction, but increasingly we see Fortune's job is to help business get better. We yeah. want business to be better. And we realized there was this huge gap between what life for today's CEO is like, and what life for the people two or three levels below them is like, you know, their right. heads down, working on their financial KPIs and sort of not really dealing with this, you know, Ukraine, oh, that's not my job. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here selling widgets. So uh, we've created something called uh, Fortune Connect is, is John Sutton's He's John Sutton right over there yeah. is, is one of the leads of the product. It's a platform designed to help the next generation leader. We've got about 25 great companies, many of whom you've talked about uh, here today. Accenture was one of the first on board, Salesforce, uh, but it's a, a, a diverse group of, of companies, each of whom has put anywhere from 25 to a couple hundred of their top executives on the platform to begin to expose them to conversations about stakeholder capitalism. What is it? What does it mean? How do you, how do you weigh the demands of stakeholders against the financial KPIs that you're dealing with every day? Uh, purpose-driven leadership. We just finished a great six-week learning sprint on purpose-driven leadership and diversity and inclusion. Like, what, what is it? What is it? If the next I mean, one of the things I love about Fortune Connect is it's many of our partners like Salesforce put heavily uh, diverse contingents of executives on there. So if the, we all know what the C-suite of today, particularly the CEO cohort of today looks like. I mean, the percentage of, of women is astonishingly small and minorities right. just shamefully small. Um, if, if, if the C-suite of tomorrow is represented by this group in Fortune Connect, we're, we're in a good place. But um, anyway, I'm sorry, I got, oh, I got distracted. But, but I think it's really important because, because the, the world is changing so fast. I mean, whoever thought this is one of the, this, is, this has got to be the most interesting moment in business in my four decades doing this because you have a tech, a, an accelerating technology transformation that requires you to basically rethink everything you do. You have a purpose transformation. All of a sudden, you know, you have to say, geez, my company isn't just about making a profit. We have to, we have, to uh, have a higher purpose. And, and by the way, it has to take into account what's happening to the environment. Um, and it has to take into account the, you know, the rising mental health problems of my employees. And then on top of that, oh, yeah, and we're going to completely reinvent how we do work <laughs> because we took everybody home for two years. And now they're kind of coming back, but kind of not coming back. And nobody knows how to do that. So it's such an interesting moment in business. And, and HR professionals are right at the center of the most interesting topics. And, and I gave some uh, things that I thought are going to be in the conversation over the next uh, year or two. And I think uh, a focus on leadership is already happening today, 
But if you go down to frontline and mid-level managers, they're going to need so much more support in this new environment that we're in totally. as to how to how to lead teams, how to how to lead people. Because a lot of it's outside of their skill sets. A lot of people don't know how to lead a hybrid team, for example, and and make that equitable in, in the organization. Totally. Totally. I, I I think we're still making it up as we we go along. Right. Now you touched on ESG a little bit there, and and uh, that's a, obviously a hot topic with a lot of CEOs that you're talking with, and it's certainly a hot topic for a lot of employees. Um, I know you've written about this, uh, you know, quite a bit. How how are you seeing that uh, play out going forward? Well, I, I should back up a little bit and tell you how I got into this whole stakeholder capitalism thing, which I'm now associated with because I've written about it so much, and I have a book coming out about it. But it wasn't out of uh, it wasn't a mission on my part. I mean, I've been a journalist literally since I was nine years old. I, when I was nine years old, I would walk up and down the street and you know take notes on people whose grandparents were visiting or won the <laughs> won the swim meet or whatever, and I typed it all up and I have it a little one. Actually, I didn't type it up. I made my poor mother, poor late mother, uh, type it up, and would sell it for a nickel up and down the the street. And I, I always, I always thought. I was in the business, not of changing the world, but explaining the world uh, and understanding the world. Um, but over the course, I would say starting around in 2008, 2009, it became clear to me in conversations with CEOs that something profoundly different was going on. Bill Gates gave a speech at Davos in 2008 talking about the need for a new creative. This is in the wake of the, the Great Recession sure. and failure of markets. And he talked about the need for a more creative capitalism. Uh, around the same time, Michael Porter, the super professor at Harvard Business School, created some groups around shared value capitalism that some of you may be involved in. Uh, uh, John Mackey at Whole Foods started talking about conscious capitalism. Right. Mark Benioff started talking about compassionate capitalism. All of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but it, you more and more, uh, you would hear people feeling they had to put an adjective in front of capitalism. Right. Something needed to be modified here. Um, and, and so I, I got into this because I saw it happening and it was growing and it was getting louder. And in some ways, the big break was in 2016 when CEOs realized the political system had left them. You had the Brexit vote in the UK. I mean, there wasn't any big company CEO who, there wasn't any authority who favored that, but it happened. Yeah. And then in the US, you had an election where Donald Trump was campaigning against globalization, against free trade. And on the Democratic side, it looked like Bernie Sanders who was a self-avowed uh, socialist or democratic right. socialist, you, whatever you call it. I mean, we, we, those of us who were around in 1990 thought that was over. And then all of a sudden there's this guy who looks like he's going to win the Democratic nomination. And so uh, a lot of CEOs at that time said, wow, we've got to get better at this because if we don't get better at this, we're going to lose our operating licenses. Mm -hmm. uh, and I heard those words from CEOs of like Fortune 50 companies. So I think that's that really uh, began to pick up speed uh, over the course of the last five years. The business roundtable statement that everybody talks about in August of 2019 was really kind of a latecomer. Uh, and, but then I'll, I'll just say one more interest. And we're, I think your question was about ESG and I've gone <laughs> off who knows where, but it's, it's related. Um, uh, the, uh, the pan when the pandemic hit, my immediate reaction as a journalist who had been through this before was, oh, this is all over now. Because, you know, in some of you may remember before the last recession, there was a big bubble of interest in business action on the environment. Uh, GE was a part of it. Companies like Duke Power. Um, uh, you at that time, you had two presidential candidates, Republican and Democrat, the leading presidential candidates, the, the nominees of both parties who favored putting limits on carbon emissions, John McCain and Barack Obama, both right. of them favored putting emissions on carbon. It's hard to imagine today yeah. that. So there was this bubble of, of interest in business action to help the environment. And then the recession hit and it all went away. So when COVID hit and we saw the economy take a downturn, I thought, well, I've seen this play before. All this talk about ESG and climate and everything is gonna be out the door. Mm -hmm. And instead, Again, this was just from my reporting and listening, the exact opposite happened because this was a stakeholder crisis. Right. Uh, 
uh, you know, and all of a sudden, CEOs were having to think about the health and welfare of their employees, in some cases, the health and welfare of their customers. They were interacting on a much higher level with government health officials. And so it actually accelerated the movement towards stakeholder concerns, ESG, whatever you want to call it. And the number of companies that have made net zero commitments in the last two years. Yeah, it's astounding. I, yeah, I saw one place it was a six. It depends on what group of companies you use, like a 600% increase. Just amazing. It is very quickly becoming uh, a requirement. Now, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, I commit to going carbon, carbon neutral in 2050 when I will be long dead and everybody <laughs> I work with will also be long dead. And it's another thing to actually take concrete actions to show you're moving in that direction. And that's where I think we still have a lot of work to do on ESG. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, you know, it, it took, 150 years to develop the financial architecture to, to hold companies accountable for their finances. So it's going to take a little while to develop the architecture to hold them accountable properly for ESG. But it seems to me all the, all the momentum continues to move in that direction. And they're being held accountable for a lot of things. You mentioned uh, DE&I earlier, and you know, we're, we're, we've seen a great increased pressure in the last five years on being held accountable there. I, you know, I'm curious, you talked to so many CEOs, and I, I guess I just view you, Alan, as being, uh, you know, as really being in touch with the mindset of the CEO. And we've got a group of HR executives out here. What do you think the, the, the typical CEO wants from the HR executive in their organization? I think it's hard. Well, look, let me say one thing. I do talk to a lot of CEOs, they may not be a representative sample. Like the true Neanderthals, I think are probably not the ones I talk to. You know, they okay. don't care about us. They don't, I, yeah. I, I think of, I, I don't know if there's anyone here from, from Exxon. I think of what Exxon used to be. I mean, they wouldn't take my call for, <laughs> you know, they didn't care. They were gonna do their own thing regardless of what anybody thought. So by engaging with fortune, you are kind of automatically signaling that you care about this stuff. You care about what the world sure. thinks. That's the nature of it. So I'm not sure my group is a fully representative subset. And when I hear data like only 52% uh, of, or 52% of, of managers think they're gonna bring their employees back full time, that increases my sense that I'm not speaking to a fully representative group of CEOs. But the CEOs I'm talking to uh, do believe that uh, the, the, the great resignation, the fraying of culture, the battle for talent. And some of it's not just resignation. I mean, I had one, C, one uh, startup AI company startup. It's now a, a unicorn, you know, $10, sure. $10 billion. The CEO said, there, there are not enough people in the world to meet the current demand for these technological changes. I, I, I wanted to see the study that showed that, but, but he was, you know, he said, said it's just, there's just such huge demand. Uh, and, and so I think what all the, all the CEOs I'm talking to are looking from their, from their HR people to solve what you've written about the culture problem, mm. uh, I, which is a little unfair because as you wrote, culture starts at the top. Right. Um, and, and, and I think what that means is that human resource professionals really have to hone their skills as counselors to the CEOs, because there's some of it is some of it is stuff you can do, but as some of it is stuff they have to do, and you have to figure out how to make the case to them uh, to get it done. So I don't know if that fits with your, you, you know, you look at this more closely than I do, but that's what I'm hearing. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And I think we have some great examples. I mean, we just had Microsoft on stage. And I think the, the culture renovation that Microsoft undertook after Satya became CEO is absolutely remarkable. And I talk about it glowingly. And I know, I know they get nervous when I do so because they think, okay, we still have a lot of issues we got to work out. Yeah. But uh, I think it's, it's lessons that any organization can follow, whether you're big or small or whether you're in tech or not. And HR played a huge role in that, in partnering with um, you know, senior executives to, to make that culture renovation happen. And, and he's also a great example of how all these things we're talking about ties, tie together. I mean, he's, he's been way out front on the uh, environmental conversation sure. because he knows it ties into culture, which ties into uh, performance, which ties into the effectiveness of his organization. Yeah. Uh, and the thing I most love about the Satya story is uh, when he said, 
we're going to be a uh, we're not going to be a know-it-all culture, which they were. They were absolutely. I mean, I, I I'm <laughs> sorry, no offense to the Microsoft people. I mean, I I went there with my iPad one time and was told I couldn't bring it in the building, and they gave me a a crummy Microsoft <laughs> pad to use instead. So it was a know-it-all. It was a know-it-all culture. And Satya said, no, we're going to be a learn-it-all culture. And bring your iPad in, by the way, because we want to see what they're doing there that's so good and, and right. learn from it. Right. So I want to make sure we have um, enough time to answer questions from folks in the audience. So just like we did in the last session, um, if, you could, if you have a question, go up to the microphone. And uh, the lights are really bright up here. So you might just need to start talking. Uh, you know, we might not see you. But we would love to entertain any questions that you have uh, for Alan uh, you know, in the, in the, the last uh, five minutes here. Um, so Alan, you know, I guess while I'm waiting for somebody to, to speak up, um, I'm just, I'm struck by the importance, I guess, of the human capital function these days. I just feel like we have um, crossed a, a line now. I can remember when I first got into this industry, HR was viewed um, very negatively, typically in an organization. And, and it was sort of from a, a market perspective, it was the redheaded stepchild, you know, people didn't really respond to it. And I just love how we have now become much more strategic as a community to organizations. And that's really what this conference is all about is, is being more strategic. I, I, I think it's great. I think you're, it, it, it's more, look, I was with on a call with, 20 CEOs yesterday talking about trust. Um, this gets back to the stakeholder conversation. Like six of them said, we're consumer organizations. Well, consumer trust is super important, yeah. but you can't have consumer trust if you don't have employee trust. And, exactly. so, and therefore employee trust trumps consumer trust. I mean, e even Peter Drucker would be shocked by those comments, right? He because would. Peter Drucker very clearly said, your, your business is about the consumer, serving the consumer. That's all what it's all about. And what I heard from six different CEOs yesterday was, well, yeah, it's about serving the consumer, but the best way we can serve our consumers, and this is like a hotel company, clothing company, Stitch Fix, uh, the best way we can serve our consumers is by serving our employees. And if you're interested in that topic, uh, the newsletter that you published this morning had great quotes from those CEOs all around trust. And I, I really appreciated what you wrote. Thank you. And it's the newsletter is worth everything. You will have to pay for it. Uh, <laughs> it, it it's free. Just search uh, my name and CEO daily and you can find out how to subscribe. All right. I think we have a question. Good morning. Bernadette Palumbo, Sonopar, USA. Alan, I'm curious if in this new world of work and future of work, thinking about how we work, do you feel that leading companies will be reflected differently in surveys such as Fortune's top employers or your competitors, Forbes, you know, top employers? And, and if so, how might that be reflected? Well, one thing has already happened. You know, the, you're talking about the 100 best companies to work for. First of all, that's been going on uh, I think this is our 25th anniversary. And it, it, it's been cool to watch it develop as this emphasis on human capital has grown because what our research shows is the group has gotten better and better with each year. So, so, so companies are really to com competing to get on this list because, and because they understand the importance of human capital and they're doing better stuff along the way. Um, uh, the process, the, the, the ranking process was tweaked. You know, it's, it, our partnership is with Great Place to Work Institute. Uh, they tweaked it to put a greater emphasis on diversity and inclusion. You know, they now call themselves the Great Place to Work for All that I think was reflective of the changes of the last couple of years. And so you, you're seeing more of that, which is a good thing. I mean, once upon a time, Again, I hate to mention specific companies, but you say we're off the record, so so I can say it. Used, it used to be the list used to be topped by Google every year, mm -hmm. um, uh, which had a lot of you know great food, <laughs> wonderful cafeteria, great volleyball pits, all of that stuff, um, but pretty lousy record on uh, diversity. So I think that's one area, um, and and then I think we've seen an uh, to, back to the Satya Nadella learn it all point. I think we've seen an increased focus on learning 
and and career advancement. And one of the things that that's kind of new is the notion that uh, that the social contract between employer and employee has changed in the sense that, hey, we're not gonna give you a job forever because that's just not the way this world works. And you probably don't even want a job forever. But what we will assure you is that when you leave here, you will be more employable. You will have a higher level of skills than when you got here. And there are even some CEOs I've talked to who've started talking, using the phrase training out. I don't know how many of you do that. I, that was nothing. Five years ago, that was not a phrase that was in my lexicon, but, but you're now starting to hear it. So I think those are two of the changes you may know of others uh, that the best companies are moving towards. Thank you very much. In fact, it's always stuck with me that um, EY, and we've got some folks from EY here, they had in their mission and purpose statement the phrase, as long as you're here, um, you know, with the idea that they're, they're going to move on in their career, likely. Yeah. They're not going to stay at EY uh, their entire career. Yeah. Now, sometimes, you know, that, that helps because they become clients <laughs> for, for the company. But uh, I think that's a very, um, uh, you know, just a solid approach to how you're looking at employees. Yeah, Reed days. Hoffman at, at LinkedIn wrote about that maybe five or six years ago, the whole notion that you can be stronger by making sure the people who leave are stronger. Yeah, and that they're advocates, for sure. Go ahead. Good morning, Tony Carter from Idaho National Laboratory. We create next generation energy solutions and protect the nation's most critical infrastructure. My question is regards to the term that we've been using probably for 40 years now in regards to human capital. From your perspectives, are we gonna ever move away from that? Because humans aren't capital. capital. We yeah. aren't infrastructure. We aren't roads and streets and we're people. And so I'm wondering what the research is showing in that area. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a good point. It's a fair point. Um, uh, and when you're talking to me, you're talking to somebody who watched Maxwell Smart when I was a kid. So I, 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 may, not, uh, I, I may not be up with the latest. I don't get, I mean, I should, I, I'm, I'm in the word business. I don't get that hung up on the semantics. I think what's happening is business is being humanized and that's good. Uh, that it's, you know, I have a colleague named Jeff Colvin who, who wrote a wonderful book a couple of years ago, years ago called Humans Are Underrated. And he was talking about this incredible technology transformation we're in the middle of. And, and what he said in the book was, you know, for a hundred years of human history, work was about getting people to act more like machines, right? That's what the 20th century was all about. Scientific management, Frederick Winslow yeah, yeah. Taylor, that's what it was all about. And he said, now we're at the point where the machines are gonna take care of themselves, thank you very much. <laughs> They're okay, and humans need to be better humans. So I think that's what we're really talking about. And I, and I apologize if you find the human capital term to be uh, dehumanizing, uh, because that's not what I mean. I, I think it is, it is humans are becoming much more central to business and to work, and that's a good thing. And that's the great promise of technology. Um, and, and, and by the way, it's also the great obstacle to technology. You, you know this, you, you had this in your book. I, I had this conversation, again, one of the CEOs who was on that call yesterday said, you know, when I started my digital transformation, I figured this is gonna be 80% about technology, getting the right technology in place, and 20% about culture, getting people in the right place so they can take advantage of the technology. Absolutely backwards. Mm. It's 20% technology, 80% people. And I, and I hear that story over and over again. One, one more anecdote on that. I'm sorry if I'm keeping you on your feet, but um, uh, uh, I do a lot of, uh, we have an, a lot of conference franchises around technology. And so I frequently and am in rooms or now more recently on Zoom calls, with say 20 to 25 or 30 CEOs or senior executives talking about technology transformation. Mm -hmm. And I've probably done 50 or 60 of those in the last four years. And without fail, you know, these are normally like an hour, hour and a half long. Without fail, the first 15 or 20 minutes is about technology. And by the time you get through the first 20 minutes, you realize you're not talking about technology anymore. It's like, how do I get my middle managers to get on board with this yeah. change? You know, How do I get my people prepared for 
what's coming. It's all about creating human systems. And so I'm going to leave this conference today and try and ban the phrase <laughs> human capital from Woo! my vocabulary. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I've got I've got a great Dilbert cartoon that I'll send to you uh, that addresses this. It is a little bit better than human resources, probably when we talk about human capital. <laughs> that's more like oil. Yeah, yeah. that's uh... yeah. But it, we do kind of struggle with how to talk about the industry. Although I, I like the uh, movement towards chief people officer, uh, which a lot of people have moved to. So I think that's that's more healthy. Good. We got a question in the corner. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Alan. Um, Marie Potter. I'm with Getty Images, and we've been looking a lot about at, a lot at building employee connectivity, and you talked about teams and how they're fraying across teams. Are you seeing any examples out there of businesses who are addressing employee connectivity, global landscape, hybrid world, and doing a pretty good job of it right now, or at least asking the right questions that could inspire some of us as we look at this work? On connecting teams? Yep. I mean, there are a lot of, a lot of different, obviously Microsoft is developing great tools, a lot of different tools uh, for that. I frankly am more anxious about cross-team collaboration. I can tell you at Fortune, that's where we've suffered, uh, is the teams are doing pretty well, but when you reach those issues that come up three times a day where two teams have to collaborate or agree on something, the friction is greater than it was when we were all in the same office. And I hear that from a, a, a lot of CEOs. So I think the missing link is not how do we support teams? I think Microsoft, I won't mention any Microsoft competitors, but there are a lot of people out there creating good tools to support teams. I think what we haven't figured out is how we, we support the interactions across teams. Yeah. The, the so-called weak ties that Jared talked about. Yeah, I think there's still, even though we've been talking about this for a few years, I think there's still a lot of innovation to be done around team performance. We spend a lot of time on individual performance and, and managing that in organizations. Yeah, most individuals spend the majority of their time on teams uh, in a typical company, and we need to be measuring team performance probably more so than That's we are. You all, you all set, Marie? Okay, good. Another, another question here. Hi, Jessica Kriegel. Thank you for this chat. It's been fascinating. So the subtitle of your book is You're Searching for the Soul of Business. What is the conclusion? Does business have a soul? If it depends, what does it depend on? <laughs> yeah, I, I, and it gets back to, to humanizing business. I think it does. Uh, uh, you, you know, I have... Uh, I, I find I can have actually interesting conversations with CEOs like, take somebody like Anil Bushri of Workday about that. Like what, 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 what is the soul of Workday? What are the values of Workday? Those are conversations you couldn't have had 10 years ago, you can't have now. So I do think they're human organizations. They're made up of people. They're no different than all of us. It doesn't mean they aren't perfect. It doesn't mean there isn't plenty of greed and misbehavior and, and corruption that goes on within them. But in a way, I think it's this movement from the 20th century notion of, of people and companies as machines to a 21st century notion of people and companies as human-centered organizations that has changed that. Now, the, the, the question, for, there, there are two big questions that that leaves for society. One is, okay, it's happening, but is it happening fast enough to meet the challenges? I think that's an open question. You know, It's amazing what business has done in the last four years around climate, but it's not enough to address the problems. It's amazing, uh, amazing might be too strong a word, but I've seen a lot of action since George Floyd's serious action to do uh, not just talk, but to, to really act in response to the diversity challenge, but is it enough to meet the problem? I don't, I don't know. So I, I, I think that's one issue and I said there were two. <laughs> I know there's another one. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> I'll get to it eventually, but. Thank you. All right, well, we're, we're just about out of time. I wanna thank Alan for joining us this morning and hope you can have a round of applause for all these great comments that he had. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Alan, very Thanks much. Thanks a lot.
And I hope everybody buys his book. You can go out and pre-order it right now. I am definitely going to do that. So thank you very much thank for you. joining us today, Alan. And we appreciate the, appreciate the partnership with Fortune that we've got from a research perspective. As do we. <laughs> All right.